So this is called our amperometry when you measure I. Sometimes people will measure Q. So we're not going to talk a lot in here about measuring uh, charge, um, Q. But if you were to do that, that would be called chronochromometry, right? And the total charge would go up something like that. Again, think, um, if this is a t to the minus one half, that's a one minus t to the one half uh, kind of rise, right? Because as the current is going off, uh, then the, the charge is not building up as much either, right? Less current means less charge building up. That's a one minus t to the one half. Um, and then if you consider the kind of balance of charge, they actually usually show that the plot goes down like this. So now, it had charge build up and now it's going to decrease in a two minus one half kind of manner. Um, again, uh, that's the oxidation reduction that you know charge builds up and then charge dissipates because it would go back the other way. Uh, again, we don't do a lot of coulometry in our particular application. I just always think coulometry means charge. You're integrating the current to get charge. Uh, you know, if nothing else, you know, keep that in mind that you can integrate charge to get to current to get charge. Um, but we're not going to talk about it too much. Um, all right, so theoretically, we can do any experiment we want. Practically, we don't do that. Right, because I just spent uh, part of the time telling you that theoretically, you know, as long as you can solve the butler Volmer equation that tells you, right, again, about how I relates to V, and then as long as you can solve all of those fixed laws of diffusion to know how mass transport is going to get there, you're fine, right? You can do any experiment you want. Yeah, well, okay, we don't want to always be doing that. Um, and so people tend to then, then instead do experiments that are easier to evaluate. So the first one, the easiest experiment to evaluate, right, is going to be a large amplitude step. I just erased all my steps. Why do those steps in the middle that can't drive the reaction to its fastest rate? Right? Why not just jump to a potential that's so, you know, sufficient to do the reaction that you can get it at the maximum rate? Right? Why bother with the stuff in the middle, basically? Um, and so most of the time, you're going to be design this um, experiment, right? You're going to jump to a financial sufficient to do the whole um, thing. And so if you do that, right, then you instantly go again, to this mass transfer and uh, limited current. So we don't stop in the middle where the amount of driving potential might not be sufficient and the electron transfer may not be quite fast. We just immediately go to where we could get the limited potential. And then, again, it's nice because electron transfer kinetics then no, they no, don't matter. They don't matter. So, um, again, most chronic experiments I see done practically in our field, this, they're, they're, they're done into a fully sufficient one. Um, all right, so, but if you didn't want to do that, you can actually do it the opposite. So if you do a really tiny, Step. What you end up getting is both of the redox forms be present. And if both of the redox forms are present, there's actually an equation called the Toffel equation that I feel like at some point in time I should write it down for you. So I will write it down. Um, the Toffel equation. It's F, many different forms of it. The standard I times F, remember we did F before, which was big F over RT, times the mover potential. So this equation relates I to over potential. So we talked about over potential before, the extra potential that you have to put in to get a reaction to happen at certain places which kinetics are not favorable. Um, again, our particular field doesn't do a lot with it. Trisha once, a former student, took her class over in electrochemistry and electrical engineering, and she said all she did the whole semester was make coffee plots. Uh, so, 
uh, inspired in the morning now I mentioned it, but I swear I've never used it. Uh, uh, we always go for the gusto uh, um, uh, in our things. Um, all right, well, obviously, if you want to make your life easy, nothing could be easier than studying a reversible product. If you're gonna, you know, choose what to study. Heck, if you want to make your life easy, choose something reversible. Um, and so, if it's reversible, right, it'll all follow the winner's degree, um, and that would make your life um, fairly easy. Um, it turns out that the next easiest after reversible is totally irreversible. So this is totally irreversible. Um, sometimes you can get it so that there's only one process that you're looking at. So you're either looking at the chemical reaction or something that takes place to clear the product so that it doesn't end up, you know, going backwards. Or if the electron transfer is slow, maybe you're only looking at but if there's something that, you know, especially if there's like a chemical reaction that occurs and gets that product out of there, irreversible might be easiest to look at. The hardest to look at are these quasi-reversible systems. So it's really hard to look at those and to measure good kinetics and to get good electrochemistry um, out of them. And we'll see, although we will not make it there today, um, uh, uh, some quasi reversible stuff in the future. Okay, so we're going to go back to diffusion. Um, when I first made my diffusion notes today um, uh, from chapter four, I thought, where is the control equation? How can it not be in there? Turns out it's in chapter on chapter four. Um, so the control equation is the diffusion control equation for um, current. I know you are probably waiting for it, but you know, when you read your own notes, like I've taught this class before, like how could I not have taught that? I was like, it's gotta be in there. And I was like, oh, it's in chapter four, not chapter four. Okay, so we're gonna go back to what happens if we have a potential step on the diffusion control. And this is what he did. 
then F A. You should be noticing a lot of I you can put in F A. Alright, so it ends up being D, the division coefficient to the one half, the concentration in the bulk of pi to the one half and T to the one half. Your, your equations I know it has pi to the one half. Um, uh, so that is the con that this is the um, equation that relates I to T. And so when you say, I just shortcutted it by, by leading you through an exercise where we said, oh yes, the potential drop off over time is T to the minus one half. This is the actual equation that it's in, right? But if you can't memorize the control equation, you'll probably memorize square root of T and get there, you know, with a little bit of hand raising. Um, but this is the actual equation uh, that gets you uh, the relationship that I've made. Um, between I and T. Um, uh, and again, this is for a potential step experiment, because notice what's missing, right? V, voltage is missing. But that's because it's for a potential step experiment, and we assume that we went to a step sufficient to do the reaction. So that's why there's no voltage in this equation. It's not a equation to tell you the relationship between current and voltage. We would like to tell you if you could do the reaction as fast as you could possibly do it. What would the rate of that be actually? What would the current look like with time? Again, uh, we're not doing all the equations, but we're hitting the highlights of the front page of the book. Um, we're checking them off. Uh, the ones that everybody thinks you should know um, as far as you get there. Right, so again, I want everybody to know this is a t to the minus one half drop off over time with potential step. Um, uh, again, this is not, this is, you know, if it's under diffusion control, this is what you're going to get. Um, and so, again, we, I don't ruin it too much, but when we do the scan rate experiment, right, in our lab, and we say, well, if it's diffusion control, right, we say I is supposed to be um, proportional to the square root of scan rate. Well, what's scan rate, right? It's voltage over time, right? Volts per second, right? So this is where you get the, oh, sorry. Um, this is where you get, right, it, uh, um, you can take a square root of that, right? You have seconds to the minus one half. So that's why it's linear with that, because it's seconds to the minus one half. So that linear, you know, with square root of scan rate comes from the control equation. Um, and so this part is not so hard to explain. Um, that, as I said, when we look at that scan rate experiment, the harder part is the absorption part. This part, oh, it, oh yes, all the fusion is t to the minus one half, right? And so I have, again, you know, I have seconds to the minus one half there, you know, and that's why I'm going to get a linear relationship. That part's not hard to explain. I always tell people when asked to explain, you know, why something is, why the scan rate changes with, um, or why, well, why current changes with scan rate, you should always start with what would happen if it's diffusion control. Maybe they'll forget by the time you have to explain the absorption control. Uh, but this is the easy part. So this is the part you got to understand. Again, you know, this is what everybody assumes it should be, even though it's not always like that. Um, Okay, um, so if you were to look at, um, you know, if you're not scanning, I'm sorry, if you're not stirring, right, the concentration profile um, over X, right, if we have some bulk concentration out here, as we said before, it just starts to look like this. So people want to know what's the length of the diffusion layer. And most of the estimates I say, I don't know, you feel some kind of confidence in there. But again, if you were to say, if, you know, if you were to get deep down into this in the question and you pulled out the tube, no way to come keep you over, right? Um, you know, as a most large chemist, I'm not sure exactly where that factor is. Uh, but they'll say that this, the length of the fusion area is like square root of dt. But again, we're at the same thing. It's the square root of dt. It depends on the fusion coefficient in time. And so this will just keep growing and growing and growing um, with time. Okay, we can do one last thing. And then that will bring us to microelectronics, which will be a great place to start tomorrow. I told you we wouldn't finish time. Um, um, all right, so we're going to talk just a second about electrode theory.
And so, right, real electrodes aren't smooth. Right, real electrodes are bulky. Right, you know, they're not, they're not completely smooth. And so the question is, does that matter for diffusion? So does this bumpiness matter? Anyone want to take a stab at answering the question? Well, here's the good news. You could all be right. So, um, the, the answer is yes. In some cases, a no. In others, all right, good. That was your question. You're going to make everybody feel good. No matter what you answer, you were right. Um, uh, so, this is, it's conditional. Um, it's conditional as to whether, whether it matters. Um, all right, so now that we, we got that down, um, let's think about it. Um, let's first just do a couple of um, things. Number one, right, you could think about a geometric area. Right, and so, like, let's say we make a cylinder electrode, right? And I can say, I know the radius, I know the length, um, I can find out the geometry, right, the surface area of that cylinder. You can probably even derive it. I can't, I can't do the cone, but I can do the cylinder. I tried to do the movie the other day, and I got stuff on the cone, but I also can't use electrodes. I can't, I couldn't figure it out. Um, uh, but you can do cylinder, so you can find a geometric area, right? And that's just assuming, you know, that's from just the dimensions. Right, but then if you were to go and measure the area, electric chemical that you can do, right, you would get a measured area. Right, and that measured area, again, may be greater than the geometric area, and you could get some sort of uh, roughness factor. That's supposed to be a row. Um, and that would be the measured area over the geometric area. Um, right, so this would be some sort of value about the surface roughness. Now, what did I think it was going to be, and then how about be kind of busy? All right, but that was an aside. So, the question is, which one do you think is better to use in your diffusion equation? You know, we have A sitting there. I is equal to NFA. Like every, every equation starts with that. You follow your cat caught the drift. Uh, you know, uh, so what A, what's A? Is it this one or is it that one? Um, and I already told you it, it was conditional, um, uh, whether it's yes or no. Um, and so it depends, right? So what do you think the conditions are? Let's see if we can think through this. Why do you think it would be conditional? I'm going to redraw my book. So what, what do you think it depends on? What the size of this, the bumpiness is, compared to what? The size of the other direction. Other direction. So, uh, total surface area. Uh, from so you think it matters? Yeah. That. I can go like that. So if my electrode is perfectly symmetrical, it's good, but if it's, you know, no not actually kind of symmetrical, um, it, it, it's, it, it, that, that's what matters though. So what we, what are we, what's the fundamental thing that, um, how much, if we're diffusion control for our experiment, how much what, what's the kind of fundamental yeah, the, uh, distance or something that defines how much current we're going to get? Well, it's an answer. Yeah, but we're talking about the diffusion layer here. I, don't, I kind of said the distance. We're talking about the diffusion layer, right? We talked about how it could grow in time. If we're stirring, then it's going to be that nice diffusion layer. Right? So what matters here is time. Because it matters, you know, how, what the scale of the diffusion layer is compared to the scale of this. So, if your diffusion layer is way out here, so if your roughness is small compared to whatever the size of the diffusion layer is, 
right? The distance that if you were here has to go compared to the distance if you were here is not all that different. In fact, they probably won't go in straight lines, right? Uh, and, and so um, if the fusion layer is greater than the roughness, then the roughness doesn't matter. Now, let's say that the size of the fusion layer is this. So I document the fusion layer in. Right, so now let's say the fusion layer is on par or smaller than you know, the size of the roughness, right? You're not going to do a fusion layer that's a nice line, like it's going to kind of follow with that. And so now, you know, the diffusion layer, the, the um, thing, and so if it's at least smaller and dimensions of the roughness, now the surface roughness really matters. And so in that case, right, so up in here, you might use just the geometric area and you'll be fine, right? But here, you probably ought to be using some sort of measured area that accounts for the surface roughness um, and to look at that. On, you know, 100 nanosecond time range, the fusion layer, maybe in the sort of 10 nanometer region, something like that. So if you're going pretty fast, um, it's going to be um, uh, uh, pretty small. Um, so yeah, so what, which of these two cases do we have? A smaller one, right? So we have, we're going super fast. So when we go super fast, that means we have a really small diffusion layer. So this is where we are in our lab. All right, we'll stop there for today. But I want to tell, this is from my undergrads in the room. Jim Demas, Professor Demas, tried to take my undergrad through this 